Welcome. The Subcommittee on Consumer Protection, Product Safety, and Data Security will come to order. Um, I want to thank all of our witnesses um, for offering their insights at today's hearing and making the effort and taking the time to join us. Um, this hearing is entitled Promoting a Safe Environment in U.S. Athletics. We're going to look at it from a number of different perspectives. Uh, the Olympics and Paralympics bring Americans together, bring really the world together, to support our athletes who compete on a global stage. And from the U.S. perspective, if you go back to the miracle on ice in 1980, uh, the hockey match against the Soviets, the dream team, basketball triumph in uh, 1992, our women's soccer championship uh, title, I guess you say, gold medal, uh, in women's soccer, soccer in 1996. Um, I could go down this list, could make a long list of this. Uh, Simone Miles uh, making history in gymnastics in 2016. Um, Team USA has so much to be proud of. And I think every country in the world has their, their Olympic stories to tell. Um, all of Team USA's historic successes are collected and memorialized uh, at the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado Springs, which having been there a number of times, I can tell you it is an inspirational place to visit and, and, and to see and feel our, our Olympic spirit uh, in, in, in the moment. Uh, the Olympic and Paralympic movement is made up of individuals dedicated to excellence, teamwork, uh, and setting the, the gold standard uh, for competition. But success is not always a given. Uh, it's, it's not only solely achieved through rigorous preparation, success is also fostered through an environment where athletes are empowered to thrive and make sure that they re reach their maximum potential. Uh, years ago, our nation was, was shaken, shaken to its core when revelations were made about horrific cases going on in USA at gymnastics. Um, law enforcement's the courts have acted diligently to bring justice to victims who were harmed. Through the work by leaders of this committee, Congress then resolved to help prevent these types of injustices from ever happening again. Uh, we passed the Protecting Young Victims from Sexual Abuse and Safe Sport Authorization Act um, and created the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Uh, located in Denver, Colorado. The center is responsible for keeping every Olympic and Paralympic athlete safe from all forms of abuse. Uh, they're in charge of investigating cases of misconduct, holding bad actors accountable, and bringing justice for victims. Our athletes make many sacrifices to represent our country on the global stage. Uh, it's up to us to make sure that our athletes are protected from any form of abuse. The Commission on the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics recently submitted a report to Congress after its two-year investigation. Uh, the report's findings show that we all have work to do to truly maintain a safe, transparent, and accountable environment where athletes can, can reach their, their ultimate potential. Uh, among the report's findings, uh, we need to carefully examine the increasing caseload being directed to the Center for Safe Sport. Um, it's stretching the center's bandwidth to conduct timely investigations. Uh, we've got to carefully examine the underlying reasons for why cases brought to the Center for Safe Sports are uh, quote unquote administratively closed without judgment or further investigation. And then finally, why fewer than half of Olympic and Paralympic athletes trust the Center for Safe Sport to maintain an abuse-free environment. Our Olympic and Paralympic athletes deserve a system that lets them focus on their goals and achievements without having to worry about, again, any form of abuse. Uh, a system that brings swift, fair, and transparent justice to every victim should be the base expectation. Today's hearing marks an opportunity for leaders across the movement to share ideas, to charge to chart that path forward. I want to welcome our witnesses today. Uh, again, thank you. I will try to thank you repeatedly throughout the process. Um, first, let me recognize uh, Ms. Juris Colon, uh, CEO of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. 
uh, uh, Ms. Dion Kohler, almost pronounced that wrong, I think Kohler's right, um, uh, director of the Center for Sport and Law, University of Baltimore School of Law, uh, served as a commissioner on the Commission for the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics. Uh, Ms. Grace French, French, I don't know, I have a hard time with the words today, the names. Uh, Grace Finch is the president and founder of the Army of Survivors, uh, and then Mr. Pat Kelleher, executive director, USA Hockey, and also co-chair of the National Governing Body uh, Council, the NGB. Um, I don't see Senator Blackburn quite here yet, but we are fortunate to be uh, joined by the ranking member, uh, Senator Cruz from Texas, and why don't I turn it over to you for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In 2017, in the aftermath of the USA gymnastics scandal, Congress established the U.S. Senator, Center for Safe Sport to safeguard amateur athletes against abuse. Few can forget Larry Nasser, the former gymnastics team physician who committed heinous acts against innocent young women. Today, the center must remain true to its mission by speedily investigating and adjudicating all such cases of physical and sexual abuse. I hope that today's conversation will recognize the important progress that the center, national governing bodies, and the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee have made in protecting athletes since Nasser's crimes. But there are nonetheless serious challenges that we will discuss today. Recent public reports, as well as testimony from athletes, advocates, and NGBs have raised questions as to whether the center is successfully carrying out its mission. Hearing these concerns, I recently led an oversight letter to the center with Chairwoman Cantwell as, as well as Senators Blackburn and Peters to request information regarding the center's processes and procedures. I'm pleased that the center has complied with this committee's request for information. But after reviewing the data, I have several concerns. First, I'm concerned about the scope of the center's jurisdiction, particularly when it invokes its discretionary jurisdiction to take minor cases that could be handled by a national governing body. I'm worried that distracts from more serious abuse cases. I'm also concerned about the percentage of cases the center administratively closes. Based on a preliminary analysis by my staff, it appears that the center has administratively closed four out of every five sexual misconduct cases where it found jurisdiction. Nearly half of those cases were closed because of a reluctant claimant. This creates doubt and ambiguity, particularly within NGBs, which are precluded by the center from taking further action after a case has been administratively closed. Next, I'm concerned by, about how long cases remain open. According to our preliminary analysis, out of 940 open cases at the center, more than one quarter have been pending for more than a year. Finally, I'm concerned about the lack of transparency with NGBs, witnesses, and those who have come forward to expose wrongdoing. While I recognize the importance of confidentiality, I hope that we can instill cooperation, not hostility, between the center, NGBs, and U.S. OPC to better protect athletes. As I conclude, I'd like to say a, a few brief words regarding the recent report released by the Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics, which was supposed to look into the overall effectiveness of the Olympic structure. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the, this commission, which was a Democrat-led effort as several Republican-appointed commissioners were unable to participate, called for dramatically more government to address imaginary problems. To improve the Olympic structure, the commission recommended creating new government sports offices, higher taxes, and more federal regulators as well as regulating Little League. Let me repeat that. The commission suggested that the federal government regulate Little League. This government commission was suggesting, 
not just mission creep, but mission gallop. To give you a flavor of the report, the word baseball appears 17 times in the report. The words diversity, equity, and inclusion, 170 times. It's not complicated what, what the commission was focused on. If the goal is to have fewer kids participating in sports and fewer parents volunteering to help, I can think of no more effective idea than having youth leagues micromanaged by virtue signaling bureaucrats. By arguing for the centralization of the U.S. athletic structure, the commission has done nothing less than propose a shift to the sports models of China and Russia. This is highly disturbing, particularly for U.S. taxpayers who funded this report, and it must be rejected. It is precisely the United States' rejection of centralized government and the embrace of freedom and localism that has produced <coughs> the greatest athletes in the world, athletes who have been able to pursue their dreams rather than have their athletic futures determined by a centralized regime. Team USA's athletic successes will continue if we reject <coughs> the centralized government recommendations of the commission. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. I hope that we can have a productive discussion about the current problems within the center and what can be done by the center, NGBs, and USOPC to protect athletes from abuse. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Uh, now we'll hear from Ranking Member Blackburn. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank each of you for taking your time and for being here today. I think that each of us share the same goal. It is to support and protect amateur athletes as they compete and represent America on the international stage. These athletes carry Americans' hopes, dreams, and ideals. They shouldn't also be forced to carry the burden and the pain of abuse. This all started with the revelations of Larry Nassar's horrific abuse of the gymnast that he was supposed to be caring for. The stories that his survivors describe are absolutely heartbreaking. We learned that some of his survivors had been abused by him for years. The description of his tactics that included sexually assaulting children with their parent in the room while he strategically blocked the parent's view, just so that the child would think this was normal, that it was all okay. So think about that. And the admission of cover-ups by the very people whose job it was to champion these little girls. That is really disturbing. After the horrors of Larry Nassar's abuse were revealed, this body rightly jumped into action and demanded better. Over eight years later, we have to keep working to improve the environment that our athletes compete in. We don't have the luxury of inaction. We've never needed a well-functioning, independent, safe sport organization more than we do right now. The mental health epidemic in this country, coupled with the increasing reports of abuse of athletes, demands that safe sport get busy, get your act together, and live up to your mission. The truth of the matter is this. Disgusting predators like Larry Nassar are still lurking in the shadows of our locker rooms, our ball courts, our gymnasiums. Safe sport was designed to root out those predators and make sure they never get within 100 yards of our young girls and boys. But instead, the reports coming from the athletes and the NGBs tell a story that is far from the standards that these young athletes deserve. Reports of investigating for years without coming to a resolution of re-traumatizing survivors of sexual assault and conducting backroom inquiries without any transparency 
have become synonymous with U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Can you imagine being an athlete, training your whole life to stand on the world stage and represent the United States only to be abused by your coach, your teammate, or your doctor? Can you imagine being a parent, trusting your precious child to the care of a coach just to discover that they have been assaulted in a place that should have been safe? And then can you imagine the very organization designed, purposefully, intentionally designed to protect your child failing over and over again? That is the sad reality of what we're facing. For decades, the Olympics have provided some of America's most memorable sports moments. We've triumphed over the communists. We've dominated the competition. We've championed American ideals on the global stage. At the heart of all of that, of all that we're talking about today, are the athletes. We have a duty to protect them, and so we all want safe sport to succeed. We all want more cases to come to a resolution in a timely manner. Better collaboration between NGBs, athletes, and the center, and more bad actors rooted out of our locker rooms and gymnasiums. That's why I'm looking forward to having a very robust conversation today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Black. Blackburn. Uh, now we will hear uh, five minutes each from our witnesses. We'll move from left to right. Um, we'll start with Ms. Colon. Yes. Oh, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Hagenlooper, uh, Ranking Member Blackburn, Ranking Member Cruz, and Chair Cantwell for inviting the U.S. Center for Safe Sport to discuss the progress that we're making towards changing sport culture as well as the work ahead of us. When the center opened our doors seven years ago, we were faced with a daunting task to undo years of inaction, restore faith in a movement that had failed too many, and finally, hold abusers and the organizations that enabled them accountable. Our work has been a catalyst for culture change. Reports of abuse and misconduct have increased by more than 2,000% since opening. People are coming forward with their stories because they know the center is a resource to them. In our first year, we received roughly 300 reports. Last year, we received 7,500. And to date, the center has received more than 25,000 reports of abuse and misconduct. The names of more than 2,000 individuals are now listed on our centralized disciplinary database. It's a first of its kind resource listing individuals who have been restricted or banned from sport, which any parent, local sports league, youth serving organization, or employer can easily access from our website. And we've delivered more than 5 million trainings to nearly 2.5 million participants in the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement to prepare them to recognize, prevent, and ultimately respond to abuse and misconduct. The center has also established policies to prevent abuse and create safe spaces for athletes across the movement. We audit every single NGB to ensure adherence to these rules, and this year have expanded audits to reach deeper into grassroots sports. There was no blueprint on how to begin this work. There was simply a critical mission and a strong will to show up for America's athletes, and that's what we have done. We continue to hear from athletes who are thankful to have had us in their court. Whether we have banned an abusive coach when law enforcement declined to, to prosecute, collaborated with law enforcement to bring an abuser to justice, acted on allegations of abuse disclosed decades later, sanctioned individuals, even leaders in sport, who failed to report abuse, or, or stepped in to seek accountability in countless other situations. We are working every day to keep athletes safe. And we've made great strides, but we are also very clear-eyed about why we are here today. We have heard the voices of participants in our process who said they were let down. We know change is necessary and are ready to make improvements, particularly as it relates to timeliness of investigations, communication, and trauma sensitivity. Eight months ago, we embarked on a deliberate top to bottom review of our response and resolution process, as well as other aspects of our work, seeking input from athletes and other stakeholders in the movement along the way. 
And we've identified an initial, initial set of changes, which included a departmental restructure and realignment, redefining the use of administrative closures, enforcing policies around consistent communication, assigning staff and resources to improve process navigation, trauma sensitivity training, and data collection. Even with these significant process changes, we acknowledge that we must continue to listen and to evolve. We pledge to continue to seek athlete input and keep Congress and the public informed. This is an inflection point for the center and for the entire US Olympic and Paralympic movement. Changes must be made to ensure America's athletes can thrive from a practice field in our neighborhoods to the podium in Paris this summer. We thank the Commission on the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics for their focus on athlete safety, and we agree that improvements must be made to ensure their protection. We also appreciate the Commission's recognition of the Center's essential role in the movement and the progress that we've made in standing up a model that has never existed before. We share the belief that every athlete, regardless of their level of play, deserves to be safe. Our cases involving high-profile athletes and coaches may grab headlines, but most revolve around grassroots athletes playing for local affiliated organizations. And a quick scroll of our CDD shows the impact that we're making in small towns and big cities throughout the country. The commission aptly pointed out that the fractured youth and grassroots sports landscape leaves athletes vulnerable to abuse, and we agree. That's why the center is requesting legislative change to establish a definition for national governing bodies that's inclusive of local affiliated organization and makes clear that NGBs have oversight over them. We also strongly support requiring youth sports organizations to consider the CDD when making hiring and volunteering decisions. Expediting case resolutions while ensuring thoroughness, fairness, and trauma sensitivity remains our top priority, and, but increased resources are necessary to these efforts. We expect reports to continue to grow exponentially, especially as new sports such as flag football and lacrosse have the potential to add more than a million individuals to the movement. With additional resources, the center will move forward with setting maximum ceilings on timeframes for case resolutions, as well as add additional investigative staff to meet the growing demand. I thank the committee and my fellow witnesses for the opportunity to shed light on the progress we're making, as well as the ways we are showing up to change for the better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Colon. Ms. Kohler. Thank you, Chairman Hicken-Laburn, Ranking Member Blackburn. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today in the capacity as co-chair of the recent bipartisan Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics. As the subcommittee is aware, our commission delivered its final report to Congress on March 1st, completing a year-long intensive study and having developed a set of policy recommendations to Congress, the states, and stakeholders in the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement. I was proud to lead this commission with my co-chair, Han Shao, and work closely with commissioners appointed by the chair and ranking member of the Senate Commerce Committee, as well as the chair and ranking member of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. These commissioners included both Olympians and Paralympians, experts on sports oversight and governance, and those with a long history of engagement on issues such as athlete safety. During the course of our study, our commission requested and reviewed tens of thousands of documents from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, and governing bodies. We interviewed hundreds of individual participants in the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement, a movement that includes millions of Americans who participate every day in youth and grassroots sports in their communities. Our commission also conducted surveys and convened focus groups, and we held a public hearing with expert witnesses and movement leaders here on Capitol Hill in September, including Ms. Cologne, Ms. French, and Mr. Kelleher. In short, our commission carried out the most comprehensive analysis of the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement and its governance ever undertaken. Ours was the first independent, governmental, and bipartisan commission tasked with evaluating this movement broadly in over four decades. I'm proud that we delivered fully on the mission with which Congress entrusted us. I urge all members of this committee, and indeed every legislator in Congress, to read through our final report. The findings we share demonstrate the urgent need for systemic reforms if our nation is to make movement sports safer, more equitably accessible, and better accountable to the public it serves. Our recommendations were the product of consensus among both Republican and Democratic appointees, and I'm encouraged by the very positive feedback we've received from members of Congress on both sides of the aisle since the report's release. 
Sports continue to bring Americans of all ages together, and it is gratifying to see a concern for athletes' safety, access, and well-being reflected in true bipartisanship here on Capitol Hill. One of the key takeaways from our report, which I'll highlight today, is that addressing just one challenge alone has proven to be a losing strategy when it comes to reforming this movement and making it safer for athletes. Broad systemic change is needed, not piecemeal adjustments that do not address the root causes of the issues we see coming up over and over again. Much of the attention, understandably, has been on changes needed to the structure and practices of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. However, addressing Safe Sport by itself without adopting other major recommendations in our final report is a recipe for further problems. That's because safety and athlete well-being within the movement depend on more than just safe sport. I hope all of you will read carefully through all of our recommendations, particularly ending the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee's unworkable dual mandate, which has exacerbated athlete safety concerns. Also central to this effort must be the creation of an independent body representing high-performance athletes within the system with its own source of funding and a statutory mission to advocate solely on these athletes' behalf. We must do more to ensure that Paralympians and those participating in para-sports at all levels are treated equally, and we identified ways to improve the Olympic and Paralympic host city bid process to advantage the United States. Additionally, it will be critical for Congress to establish a stronger method of public oversight so problems do not fester and movement institutions are more accountable to Congress and the American people. I have included a copy of our report's summary of findings and recommendations, along with my prepared testimony for the hearing record. Again, I want to thank the subcommittee for its attention to these important issues. I appreciated the opportunity to serve as the commission's co-chair and one of the Senate Commerce Committee's appointees. I look forward to answering any questions you might have about our final report, our findings, and our recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kohler. Ms. French. Thank you to Subcommittee Chairman Hickenlooper, Ranking Member Blackburn, and the esteemed Subcommittee members for the opportunity to speak today on sports safety from the perspective as an athlete and a survivor. I appreciate the committee's dedication to supporting all athletes and addressing this crucial issue. I am Grace French, the founder and president of the nonprofit organization, The Army of Survivors, or TAUS. We promote awareness, accountability, and transparency on abuse in sport through advocacy, education, and resources. In 2018, I spoke up about the abuse I endured from the now infamous USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University doctor. The abuse occurred from ages 12 to 19. Only when I came forward did I learn that the initial report of his abuse to the university was in 1997, when I was two years old. As a young athlete, I was unaware of my vulnerability to abuse. Athletes are at a high risk due to their demanding schedules, their close relationship with, co with coaches, physical care, competitive pressures, and limited career window. I focused on excelling in my sport and trusted the institutions and authority figures to protect me. In the summer of 2018, 40 survivors united to envision a future where athletes can train and compete free from violence, recognizing we weren't alone in our sport experiences. The army of survivors emerged to transform pain to power. Since then, our organization has grown quickly, connecting with numerous abuse survivors in sports globally. Congress has responded with new laws after the abuse among athletes came to light, We've continued to hear from many athlete survivors that more needs to be done. Starting in May 2022, Taos interviewed dozens of athletes in various sports, genders, ages, and competition levels about reporting sexual assault experiences through the U.S. Center for Safe Sports process. Their testimonies highlight disturbing common themes. A full report of our findings is available and will be submitted with my comments. The bottom line is Safe Sport does not have the trust and respect of athletes, coaches, families, or sports communities. For some athletes, reporting to Safe Sport can be a first step in their journey to healing and accountability. But from our experience, no athlete has seen the center that way. If Safe Sport is truly too important to fail, it needs to commit to systemic changes in how it functions. 
Our primary concern lies in the re-traumatization of survivors of sexual abuse within the safe sport process. These survivors have been disregarded, hushed through non-disclosure agreements, and subjected to excessively lengthy investigations, some lasting years. Second, safe sport must increase transparency of its process and improve communication. Safe sport arbitrarily closes cases without providing details to survivors and retaining jurisdiction even after closure. This hinders external investigations and accountability. For example, at the end of 2022, Safe Sport suddenly administratively closed what appeared to be hundreds of cases. Taos was flooded with calls from survivors because of the sudden closures, and no one was staffing Safe Sport during winter break to answer their questions. This could have been a life threatening situation for those athletes. Third, Safe Sport must connect survivors to mental health resources and allow for support from victims' advocates. One male survivor shared that when he mentioned suicidal ideation to his investigator, and in response, they gave a hotline number and in the same day, closed his case. Additionally, investigators themselves seem to lack an understanding of sports operations. A survivor had to explain their sports operations to investigators and the conflict and safety concerns to get the safety measures they needed. Fourth, Safe Sports should collaborate with survivors and experts. SafeSport hasn't partnered with survivor organizations like Taos to adopt a trauma-informed approach, and despite attempts to communicate, there has been limited response. Only in the last few weeks did SafeSport reach out for Taos's expertise without addressing concerns that we sent uh, more than a year and a half ago. Lastly, but not least, SafeSport must prioritize the prevention of abuse. By centering prevention stat strategies, we can make sure these abuses don't happen in the first place. As an athlete founded and led organization, Tau stands ready to work with you on bipartisan, no to low cost solutions so that we can set a global example for other nations. As one example, Tau supports Representative Deborah Ross's draft bill, the Safer Sports for Athletes Act of 2024, which is expected to be introduced shortly in the House. The bill aims to enhance athlete safety, streamline the reporting process, and aligns with the commission's recommended reforms for a more cooperative and trauma informed approach. Safe Sport has confused their priorities, like many institutions, including the ones that failed me. They are prioritizing their brand and reputation over safety of athletes. All the children in sport are watching, and all the survivors of abuse in sport are waiting for meaningful change. Now is the time for that change. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. French. Uh, Mr. Keller. Thank you, Chairman Hickenlooper, Ranking Member Blackburn, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's a privilege to be here with you today to discuss athlete safety, an issue that is a top priority every day at USA Hockey, both on and off the ice. While the focus today is on the effectiveness of the US Center for Safe Sport, it's important to highlight the significant role our national governing bodies, or NGBs, play in both grassroots and elite athletics in our country. In my role as Executive Director of USA Hockey and also for nearly four years now as the Chair of the NGB Council within the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, I have firsthand knowledge of the essential role NGBs play in providing infrastructure and opportunity for our youth through sport. We know there is always room for improvement, but the importance of the NGBs in positively contributing to the overall health and well-being of children and adults throughout sport cannot be overstated. While we have seen conduct, conduct that is deplorable in both sport and across society, NGBs have worked diligently in concert with the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, and others to improve the landscape for everyone involved, particularly related to athlete safety. So while it's important to learn from the past, it is also important to recognize the great good NGBs contribute to in our overall society. Related to the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, I'd like to first share the unequivocal support for the concept of the center and its mission from the NGB community. The U.S. Center for Safe Sport is a necessary, valuable, and important part of the landscape of youth and elite sports within the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement. And we believe that all youth sporting organizations should be subject to the same standards NGBs are required to have in place, including background screens, safe sport training, mandatory reporting, and monitoring and auditing of their programs to ensure compliance. There are, however, substantial changes needed and needed now to restore faith and confidence in the center to appropriately reflect why it was created. We need the center to be effective in performing its mission. The reason we're all here is because our greater sporting community, including the NGBs, have lost faith that the center will timely, properly, and fairly resolve cases of misconduct. 
At USA Hockey, I'm proud to say that we've been a leader and a champion of safe sports since its introduction. And our general counsel, Casey Jorgensen, who is here with me today, has played an important role in working with others to bring positive and productive changes for change, excuse me, positive productive concepts for change forward to improve the deficiencies in the system. We also appreciate the recent work of the Commission on the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics on the topic of athlete safety. While we've shared our concerns with the center, we haven't seen substantial change yet. And as we sit here today, significant and meaningful progress is still needed. I'd like to share the areas we feel are most significant that need to be addressed to help restore the faith and confidence in the center. First, to improve operational effectiveness of the center, including exercising jurisdiction only over the most egregious cases that require center involvement. Significant changes to the response and resolution process to increase communication with and transparency to the involved parties. And reaching a decision on the merits of every case for which it accepts jurisdiction, which would reduce the number of administrative closures and free up the center's resources to address the most serious cases. Secondly, oversight of the center, which could include requiring the center to appear before congressional committees to report each year on its operations, and also having NGB and athlete representatives who serve on the center's board of directors elected by those bodies rather than selected by the center. And third, funding. As the federal government has mandated the operation of the center, we firmly believe the center should be federally funded and subject to congressional oversight. These issues are central in our collective efforts to help restore the trust and credibility in the center that is so essential. In addition to my opening remarks, I've also submitted two other documents, one from the NGB Council that details requests for change to the center dated December 4th, 2023, and another from USA Hockey in response to Center's request for feedback on its resolution process dated December 8, 2023. I also believe you have our response to Senators Blackburn and Peters dated February 21, 2024, addressing their request to USA Hockey for feedback on the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Thank you again for the invitation to be here today. On behalf of USA Hockey, we look forward to supporting collaborative efforts needed between NGBs and the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, among others, to find common sense solutions that make a positive difference in keeping our sports landscape as safe as possible. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kelleher. Thank all of you. Appreciate you again. Uh, I'll keep thanking you, but for making the time and coming. Uh, your, your participation in this is very important. Um, Ms. Colon, let me start with you. I mean, we're all going to just get, get five minutes of questions. Um, thank you for your testimony um, and all your work leading the center. Um, as you know in your testimony, the center aims to improve its, its investigative processes and reduce the number of, of administratively closed cases. Um, some of the athletes have expressed concerns about the increasing rates of, clo of cases that have been closed without resolution. And I guess the question is, do you believe the scope of the center's exclusive and discretionary jurisdiction, does that impact the caseload uh, and lead to the high rate of, of, of administrative closures? So, how can we make sure that athletes are getting the resolution that they, they need and that they deserve? And is there a way to you know, prioritize uh, based on the type of risk to present it to an athlete? Thanks for your question, Senator. Um, I hope I get all, I think I jotted down all of them, so if I missed one, please <laughs> just let two. me know. Just two. Um, I think I'll, I'll first start with, with ex jurisdiction of the Center for State Sport. As you know, the center has exclusive jurisdiction over sexual misconduct and discretionary jurisdiction over emotional and physical abuse misconduct and volume. It plays, certainly plays a, a large role in, uh, in the number of cases that we receive and, of course, how we close those. When we think about jurisdiction and how it impacts the center's operations, particularly as how we close cases, how we process through cases, I do think that the jurisdiction certainly impacts that uh, because we're drawing from, from more than 50 sports across a very vast and very unique sporting environment. Um, and so we do get a considerable amount of allegation of abuse, sexual abuse, misconduct, and emotional and physical abuse. Um, what I think is important to note is that while the Center for State Sport keeps all of the sexual abuse allegations, no matter how minor, um, we do typically uh, decline jurisdiction of emotional and physical abuse misconduct cases back to NGBs for them to handle. Um, we, of course, keep some of those, um, particularly if they present a conflict of interest or if it's particularly egregious. Um, I would say that jurisdiction alone um, impacts the timeliness and our ability to close, but it's also volume and scope. Um, as I noted in my opening statement, you know, we received 300 reports the first year, 7,500 last year, and right now we are averaging about 184 cases a week. 
Um, and we have, you know, certainly taken a top to bottom approach and look at everything that we're doing as far as reviewing allegation of abuse and reviewing how we process those. But as the center continues to receive more reports, as more sports continue to come into the movement, that volume will certainly rise, particularly for the time being. Uh, I do think the center, you know, as far as reporting or providing more closure uh, and answers to, to athletes, which we certainly owe them, um, we do have a lot of work to do when it comes to communication. And we certainly have a lot of work on how we process those and then sharing those, not only with NGBs, um, but also with survivor groups, athletes, and other stakeholders. Well, the athletes especially. Absolutely. I agree. Um, Ms. French, uh, thank you for your work on advocating on behalf of the, the safety of our athletes across the entire spectrum of the Olympic and Paralympic uh, movement. I think your, your work's instrumental in making sure that this, this harm doesn't continue. Um, we certainly here want to make sure that we do everything we can to create reforms that prevent uh, this kind of abuse uh, and that they're effective and, and actually improve the lives of athletes. Um, among the many recommendations discussed to reform the environment in the Olympic and Paralympic movement, which do you look at as, as most essential? What should be the, our highest priorities? Thank you so much for your question. Um, I, it's, a, it's an incredibly important one, and um, I will pull from the commission's report. I think changing the culture within the sporting environment will allow us to better uh, create systemic change from the bottom up. If we are giving safe spaces to athletes in the beginning, we allow them to better understand what they can and should expect from safe adults, and we get rid of the no pain, no gain culture that exists today and allows perpetrators and abusers to thrive. The Army of Survivors and others are working on the space in prevention, and there's a lot of promising strategies around best practices with uh, prevention in this space. Thank you. Um, Mr. Keller, uh, thank you for all your work you do for USA Hockey. Um, and as co-chair of the National Governing Body, the, the, the NGB Council, um, your work's essential to gathering feedback, collecting it from all these different sports um, you know, across the entire movement. Um, you discussed why NGBs need more transparency uh, in your testimony uh, from the Center for Safe Sport to prevent uh, abuse. Uh, how could the NGBs work cooperatively with the Center for Safe Sport and still preserve their right to exclusive jurisdiction over cases of misconduct? We certainly believe in independence in investigations. We feel we need to be more collaborative with the Center in policy making. I think that's really crucial. Um, the NGBs, as Ms. Cologne stated, there, there is an incredible workload. We recognize that. However, we do think, we do think the operational effectiveness continues to need to be improved. Uh, more, taking on more cases makes it harder to close cases, just obvious with the numbers that, that have been shared this morning. So how are there ways that the cases that could go back to the, the national governing bodies to handle could be addressed? We think that's very critical. Administrative closures obviously is another one um, where the NGBs have limited knowledge of what happens and we don't know that it makes sports safer sometimes. Ultimately, the NGBs believe we are great teammates and want to be great teammates, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport and the U.S. OPC, because all of us have the same goal is to rid all of these bad actors, all of these situations from sport. So the more collaborative approach, input from NGBs into policymaking, we think will be helpful and avoid any unintended consequences and ultimately make sure that we continue our work to provide the safest environment for every participant in sport. Great, I appreciate that. Ms. Kohler, I'll come back to you. Um, I'm gonna yield now to uh, Senator, Senator um, uh, I'll help you, yeah. Senator Moran. Yeah, Mer Senator Moran from the great state of Kansas. I was just, I had that moment. Uh, I understand. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm glad we're here, but I'm sad we're here with uh, yet concerns about the safety of uh, U.S. Olympic athletes. Um, Senator Blumenthal and I led the effort uh, in regard to sexual abuse among the gymnasts. 
the passage of Empowering Olympic and Paralympic Amateur Athletic Act uh, occurred in 2020. Uh, it included the commission that now reports uh, to us. Um, I guess I'd start with asking is are, are Olympic athletes safer today than they were before the enactment of 2020? Uh, maybe that's a question for, I don't know, Ms. French? I think there have been many measures put in place that have allowed safety to become more of a priority. I still believe there's a lot of work to do and there's ways that we can create more culture change and uh, more trauma-informed uh, systemic change that will allow us to create safer environments for athletes. Um, I think, I mean, that's clear. I, I, I do want to hear that there's, it's safer today, that progress is being made. And uh, Mr. Keller, perhaps you could address that in hockey or other NGB athletes. Uh, sure. Things better today? Things are better today. Uh, recognize that. And again, as you mentioned, Olympic athletes, we're also within all of our scope, we're talking Olympic athletes, Paralympic athletes, we're also talking grassroots sport participants. At USA Hockey, we have members as young as five years old that get on the ice to play our sport, so it's protecting, making sure they are in the safest environment possible, and frankly, at the highest level, there, there are certainly concerns to still be addressed, but the grassroots level, where some of these um, de delays and or cases that take too long really have an impact on the local level that we feel could be addressed um, by the local programs or by the NGBs to help resolve some of these things that are not, you know, federal cases to say. You indicated that um, the NGBs would like to play a greater role. Uh, Ms. Colon indicates that uh, money and volume are problems. And you, one of your solutions, I think, as I understood, was that you could do more of the cases that were non-sexual allegations. Uh, do the NGBs, are they equal in that capability? They are not. Uh, and there would be a difference, I assume. We saw this uh, in what we investigated a number of years ago. Would you describe that problem or challenge to me? You are correct. I mean, we have over 50 national governing bodies, all different shapes and sizes. Um, we have many that are under, their overall operating budget is under, I think we have 19 NGBs that operate in a budget of less than $5 million annually. So they are limited. However, some of those smaller NGBs have less participants. Right, they have less people to cover. They certainly have issues, and, and all of us collectively, anything sexual in nature, we need to go to the center. Everybody across the board, NGBs are 100% on that. Some of these issues, however, that can come back that a larger NGB, such as USA Hockey, deals with, we have people in place. We have, volunteer, we have a volunteer structure. We have 34 affiliate organizations that have people in place dedicated to the work of, of fulfilling what we need to keep athletes safe at the grassroots level through safe sport. So there are, there are ways to do that, um, and hopefully that would help lessen the load and allow the center to pursue more of the, what we would term as egregious cases. Ms. Colon, does that appeal to you, uh, the ability to have the NGBs uh, take care of cases? You, you have a challenge with volume. Is this a solution to that problem? I think the, that could be one of the solutions to the problem, right? I agree with Ms. French that this is a systemic culture shift that is needed. And in order for ab abuse to really be rooted out uh, and to be handled, it takes a really proactive approach, right? And a collaborative approach across all the organizations. Um, I don't think that uh, handing over all the allegations of sexual abuse misconduct for all NGBs to handle um, is the right move. I also don't think that all NGBs are prepared, as Pat said, you know, that most, a majority of the NGBs are small uh, and they don't have the resources to be able to handle dozens, hundreds, thousands of emotional and physical abuse misconduct cases. And what we know is that the numbers of, a, of reports are going up. They will continue to go up. And if they're not ready right now to handle those cases, um, you know, if those numbers, if history shows us anything, if those numbers, you know, double uh, or triple over the next several years, I think we could be in a very similar situation. So I think it's part of the solution. Uh, but I do think that there are more things that need to be done, you know, including efficiencies and in investigations, uh, proper funding that could really help support that so that we don't have people who are waiting for resolution, particularly on the emotional and physical abuse side. If we, if the Congress, I mean, one of the recommendations of the commission is more federal dollars, uh, more than the 10 million that was appropriated 
I'm also an appropriator that deals with this number. If that money was available, how would it change the outcome uh, of your work? You know, money doesn't solve everything. I'm aware of that. <laughs> um, I am forever grateful as a center is that we were able to get funding through the Empowering Olympic and Paralympic Amateur Athlete Act was passed in 2020, and that really helped the organization become what it is today. Um, if we think back to 2019, uh, when we were struggling and negotiating for funding, uh, it was not a great place for the center, uh, and the backlog was tremendous. And so similar to 2020, I would expect 2024, if additional funding came in in 2024 or 2025, that funding would not only go towards increasing investigators, so we have more people to actually handle these cases, but also make significant invest investments in technology so that we can start to streamline more and have more efficiencies throughout the entire process. Mr. Chairman, this is my last question. So the thing that stood out to me and then that stays with me from the investigation and the results of our efforts a number of years ago was the question by uh, traumatized and victims, traumatized athletes and who are victims, and their question was, why was there more than one? Um, why was there more than one athlete that was uh, sexually abused? And I mean, we have, we need reporting, we need response, law enforcement. Time and time again, these ladies were failed by a system that should have protected them and it didn't. Is I just wanna know, and I don't know that any of you are the people that can answer this question, but I wanna know for my own well-being and understanding and what responsibilities we have here on this committee, is there anything out there that we ought to be aware of that is worthy of further investigation Anything, let me, let, let me put the question this way. Part of what we want to do is prevent, in fact, rather than investigate cases, we want to prevent cases. Is there anything that this Congress, this committee should be doing that would prevent additional? So there's not one more. Can I answer that? <laughs> um, I think there's, there's a lot of things that can happen, right? Um, I think we'll all agree that what happened in gymnastics, what has happened in other sports is one too many. Uh, and it is, certainly th it is certainly what keeps me, my team, I'm sure many people on this panel up at night. And we know that throwing uh, more investigators at a problem after the fact is only helping to solve one part of the problem. At the end of the day, what we want is prevention. We don't want to have to do this in the first place. And so I think what we have done so far, and there has been great strides and great progress made, but what we have done so far is set a baseline for what is acceptable and what is not within the Olympic and Paralympic movement. We've required education, we've required policy, we've required adults who work with children to understand and recognize and report rules. And if that was extended to others throughout youth sport, because there is a considerable amount of overlap and people who jump from Olympic sport to NCAA to youth, uh, to local youth sports organization, to a local, local high school, if that was in some way streamlined, if they also had the requirement to at least check the centralized disciplinary database to make sure that who they were putting in front of their youth weren't barred or suspended from the Center for Safe Sport, that could be one piece. If those people were required to take prevention education that was quality, that really focused on prevention uh, annually, year after year, that would also help. So I think there are a lot of things that we can do collectively that would really help to stem and curb abuse because all of us in this room, wherever you're sitting, we don't wanna have hearings like this. We don't wanna have conversations like this because we don't wanna have to be in this situation in the first place. We had hoped that, that, that what you just described would have been accomplished by now. Thank you. Senator Peters. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Hickenlooper and, and Ranking Member Blackburn. Thank, first off, thank you uh, for holding uh, this hearing here today. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of the subcommittee for this one hearing. I'm not a normal member, but an issue that both of you know I care deeply about. And uh, uh, Senator Moran, uh, I want to thank you again for your leadership uh, as we were dealing with a an incredibly egregious, a horrible uh, uh, abuse situation in Michigan uh, and your leadership uh, during those days and passing the legislation. Uh, thank you for doing that. And I wanna thank all of our witnesses here. Um, uh, you're right, none of you wanna be here. We don't wanna be here, but we have to be because we're dealing with a very, very 
serious issue that continues to be incredibly uh, challenging. And I'd like to just take a moment to uh, especially thank uh, Grace French. Grace, thank you. Thank you for, for not just being here, uh, but for all of your work that you do as an advocate for athletes uh, and survivors uh, of, uh, of abuse. Uh, uh, you're a big reason why we're here today talking about this uh, very important issue. And so no, I'm, uh, I'm proud to be your senator. Uh, I'm proud to see you uh, leading uh, this, this effort. Uh, it's courageous and uh, is appreciated by so many people. I have been concerned uh, about this issue for a long time, uh, and that's why in 2020, working with Senator Moran, then chair, uh, as part of the Empowering Olympic, Paralympic and Amateur Athletes Act, I was able to secure an amendment that established an annual survey of uh, athletes and asked their thoughts on how matters of abuse and sexual harassment are being handled uh, in their respective sport. Uh, in the uh, most recent survey, only about, of the th only about a third of the athletes were satisfied with the support that they were receiving. Uh, that finding uh, should be a signal uh, to, to all of us that we need to do more. Uh, and today's hearing uh, and the commission's recent report, I think, will hopefully get us uh, uh, continue uh, that we get down the road to meaningful reform. So, Ms. French, uh, my uh, first question uh, is, is for you. According to the commission's report, safe sport, uh, quote, uh, does not adequately employ trauma-informed practices, um, end of quote. Uh, in many cases, uh, victims are hesitant to file claims because they think safe sports process will actually traumatize them. Uh, many also perceive that the system is, quite frankly, just stacked against them, so why bother? So my question for you is how can Congress and, and safe sport itself act to lessen the burden on victims and coming forward and, and actually seek resolutions that we, we so desperately need? Thank you, Senator Peters, and thank you for your question. Um, our main concern has been transparency and communica communication from Safe Sport on how the investigation process is going and coming to decisions to the extent allowed by law. Um, the lack of clarity uh, leaves athletes unsure of whether their concerns will be investigated thoroughly. Um, Safe Sport needs to make sure that those communications are trauma-informed and are not re-traumatizing through that process. And um, we also believe that with the appeals process, there's an another option for preventing re-traumatization by allowing there to be a uh, different process. Right now, what seems to be happening and what we're hearing from victims is that it's basically a retrial as they're going through that appeals process that ends um, oftentimes with that athlete dropping because they don't want to be re-traumatized through that process. Um, and that can sometimes lead to the respondent's uh, advantage in that moment. Um, I will say that um, if Safe Sport uh, interacts with survivors in a more trauma-informed way, I think there will be increased trust from those people and we will get more resolution faster and those abusers who are allowed to thrive currently because uh, those survivors are scared to come forward, will then be taken out of the system, and we can start preventing abuse that way as well. well if I could follow up a uh, question on that, uh, uh, one of the proposed reforms was a victim advocate to improve uh, safe sport experience for, for uh, athletes. Uh, what are your thoughts about that uh, re proposed reform? I think it's incredibly important that victim advocates are a part of the process. One of the main things I do want to stress there is that they're completely independent from the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Um, they are not employed by them because within that becomes a conflict of interest and a lack of trust from the athlete's perspective, that they may not have always the best intention of the athlete um, when they are uh, going through that process and making sure that that advocate is trained, is trauma-informed, and really is making sure that the athlete is at the center of all, of all that they're doing. Well, thank you. Again, thank you, Ms. French, for being such a powerful advocate. We appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now I'll turn it over to the ranking member who is far more than a ranking member. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Senator Chairman. Blackburn. 
And Ms. French, thank you so much. I think you're the reason we're here. And we appreciate your willingness to speak up. Uh, one question for the entire panel, and I know we have interested parties in the audience. I'm going to open this to everyone in the room. How many of you think safe sport needs reform? Raise your hand. I would say that is, that's a majority. It certainly is of people that are here. So Ms. Cologne, let me come to you because I appreciate your testimony today. I appreciate the phone call that we had earlier and I know that you are working to make some changes. Um, we've heard such troubling reports that during a, a safe sport investigation, communication with the NGBs and the claimants is almost non-existent. Ms. French just mentioned that in her response to Senator Peters. And I really feel that this could end up being a dangerous situation for these athletes. They're young, they are training. I'm a mother and a grandmother. I think many times it's so important to have that communication to truly work through uh, an issue. And when you don't share any information with the NGBs, then it really hamstrings their ability to keep bad actors away from the kids. Mr. Keller referred to this in his testimony. And particularly in instances where you use administrative closure, that leaves the claimant without a resolution. The NGB is left in the dark. And the sad thing about this is when you approach it that way, the abuse can continue because the abuser feels as if they got by with this and they beat the system. And on top of that, when you also keep information from survivors of sexual abuse, that is something that risks re-traumatizing them. And Ms. French mentioned that as something that's a need. So let's talk first about what are you going to do? What is the plan to improve the communication with the athletes, the claimants, the NGBs, so that we really go after ridding sports of these abusers. So very quickly. Sure, thanks for the question, Senator. Um, you know, there's a number of things that we're doing in order to increase tra uh, transparency and communication, not only with, with athletes, claimants, respondents, NGBs, and others throughout the process, because we recognize that over the years, the co communication has not been exactly what people have wanted, particularly on the NGB side, and it has made things difficult for them. Um, and so, you know, about nine months ago, we started a top to bottom review of our entire investigative process because we wanted to one, understand. And what, when will that be completed? We are actually making some announcements on April 1st. We're actually, we're making announcements tomorrow to some NGBs okay. with some of these changes actually going into effect on April 1st. Okay, that, that is a positive step. I know John Manley, who represented some of the survivors of the Nasser abuse, has said that he recommends his clients not to go through you all because your process can go for 497 days. Uh, he has said, his quote here, that they are slow, cumbersome, biased, and often handled incompetently. So getting some communication and then addressing the speed. What are you doing about timely manner? So first, I, I would I would disagree with with Mr. Manley's statements. Well, those um, are his opinions. Right, and uh, he's been in this process. Yes, I I'm a, I understand. Yeah. Um, as far as timeliness goes, you know, part of the the changes that we've made that I mentioned earlier will go to improve the efficiencies and timeliness of our investigation. Hey, do you need a shot clock put on Safe Sport? A shot clock. A shot clock that you've got maybe a certain period of time that you have to address this. You know, as we've worked on issues with the 
NCAA. Mm -hmm. One of the things, uh, Senator Booker and I have a bill. I mean, you, you get that, you've got to take an action, and if you don't, maybe after a year, uh, you consider this revolved, it resolved in the claimant's favor. Where our goal is to not have any case go longer than a year. Like that right. is our Let own internal personal one shot clock. Then, you had an eleven million dollar surplus in twenty twenty two in your budget. So, what exactly did you use that money for, and why did you not go hire more investigators and pick up the pace on these investigations? We did. We did. In fact, we reduced the number of cases that were open in 2020, 2021, and 2022. We do have a reserve um, rather than a surplus in the budget, and that is going to be used to carry us through the next several years because next year we anticipate a $1.5 million deficit. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And before I come back to Ms. Kohler, um, Senator Moran, I, I will never just wanted to make sure I appreciate your tenacity to be, to be here after all the work you did on it uh, previously. So now you're going to get, I'm going to ask a, a question of Ms. Kohler. Uh, Senator Klobuchar is on her way, so you'll be grilled relentlessly. Um, Ms. Kohler, the uh, uh, Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics spent months looking at every aspect uh, of Olympic and Paralympic ecosystem. Um, many findings and recommendations for Congress to consider um, all around improving safety of athletes. Uh, can you kind of underscore the areas you believe Congress could specifically support Center for Safe Sport, um, but also which areas you think Safe Sport could offer reforms on their own? Thank you, Senator. Um, our top line recommendation um, after studying this was that the funding for Safe Sport um, must be delinked from the USOPC. That that um, was a credibility problem in terms of encouraging survivors, encouraging victims to come forward, that that link to the USOPC mm. was something that was um, a disincentive. So without an independent funding source, um, Safe Sport will continue to be seen um, by victims as an arm of the USOPC. We heard it over and over and over again, um, or governing bodies um, making folks less likely to come forward. What we did is we highlighted the, U the United States Anti-Doping Agency as a success story. Um, their funding comes through congressional appropriations, and they are sort of universally respected um, as independent, um, fair um, by athletes, coaches, and others within the movement. So that was our top recommendation for Congress, um, is to essentially put safe sport on the USADA model um, with direct congressional appropriations. Um, in terms of what safe sport can do on its own, I think Ms. Colon has, has talked about those things, and, and they're quite open to doing it, as we noted in our report. Um, hiring more staff who are trained in trauma-informed practices, using arbitrators with a background um, in handling trauma cases, closing fewer cases administratively and jurisdictionally, improving the way uh, Safe Sport conducts event audits and education, et cetera. So I think all of the things that Ms. Colon has talked about um, that they are aware of, clearing out those backlogs, are things that we've recommended in our report uh, that Safe Sport undertake. Great, thank you. Um, and Ms. French, we've heard uh, a number of times uh, at the hearing today on the importance of, of trauma-informed best practices. You talked about that. Pretty much everyone's touched on that. Um, have we missed anything on that? In other words, are there other recommendations um, so that we can avoid recreating the trauma, as several people have, have, have described, to make sure that we can still protect athletes without forcing them to relive some of the worst moments of their life? Thank you for your question. Um, I think for us, it always goes back to the principles of what being trauma-informed means. Um, it's understanding the pervasiveness and impact of trauma, mitigating and transforming those effects, minimizing re-traumatization, supporting healing, resilience, and well-being, and then attending to the impact of trauma organizationally. I think within Safe Sport, it starts with a staff-wide training on its impacts and then proceeds with the examination of policies and procedures of Safe Sport across the board uh, to see how they can make more trauma-informed adjustments based on those above principles. 
Um, SafeSport needs to review their trainings, their processes and practices, and the handling of cases so they can minimize that re-traumatization. Um, it's a systemic and thoughtful approach that takes into account every step and every process within SafeSport rather than just hiring social workers who may or may not have a trauma-informed background and uh, for the investigation. I think it's, it's, a, it's a systems change. It's not just one solution. Right. Well, I, I completely agree. And I think there's, at some point we'll get further into that. And this is, is a, something that's going to have application far beyond the, the work you're just doing here in terms of how this country deals with uh, trauma and, and, and assault. Um, Ms. Cologne, uh, and I'm not trying to, you, I don't expect you to be on top of every single case, um, but Colorado Public Radio uh, reported on the story of a 13-year-old swimmer who was uh, reported to the Center of Safe Sport for an alleged uh, incidents of, or instance of misconduct. Uh, it took the 13-year-old three months to learn what the accusations were for an event that had occurred 10 months earlier in 2021. Um, as of January, it's still an open case. Uh, the athlete is now in high school and still under temporary sanctions imposed by Safe Sport. Uh, local police have investigated the case. Had, they had already investigated and dismissed the incident within weeks. So, I mean, is this indicative? What's the average length that a case stays open? Thanks for the question. And I actually stayed on top of this one. <laughs> um, in fact, this case has been resolved. Uh, and I personally spoke to some of the parents that were involved in this just to, one, um, express my apologies for this taking so long. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the sheer volume of cases sometimes puts cases that aren't that serious on a longer waiting list. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we address that for sure. I think when you think about um, how we can increase the, the timeliness to make sure that we don't uh, have cases that sit this long as well, I think we've covered a little bit of that here, particularly with process changes um, and how we are gonna be adapting some of the, the actual investigative process along with additional staffing. Appreciate that. Um... And we do have Senator Klobuchar uh, on remotely, uh, just to show you our technological capacities here. Um, why don't I turn it over to Senator Klobuchar for some questions. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Chair. Thank you for just allowing me to get some questions in here at the end. Um, uh, Ms. Cologne, um, uh, we are going to be excited to be hosting the Olympics gymnastics women's finals in Minnesota. and. So many of those athletes have shown such incredible courage in coming forward uh, about their own experiences of abuse at the hands of Larry Nasser. And I know my colleagues have asked a lot of questions on these grounds, um, but could you just generally talk about what Safe Sport is doing to ensure that the types of abuse uh, that Larry Nasser perpetrated can never happen again and how you're coordinating with law enforcement? Sure. Thank you for the question, Senator. I think there are a couple of things that the Center for State Sport is doing, particularly in relation to our work with law enforcement. First and foremost, every staff member at the Center for State Sport is a mandatory reporter. Um, and so when we receive an allegation of abuse misconduct, a sexual abuse misconduct, we report that immediately to law enforcement in respective states. Um, so I think that's key. Also, you know, because of what we deal with each and every day, you know, we often bring in law enforcement and they bring them to the Center for State Sport to either investigate or implement certain things when they're uh, th throughout an investigation. So I think that close alignment with law enforcement throughout the process is really critical to our success and our ability to actually handle, handle cases. When we think about uh, keeping athletes safe, though, before abuse happens, I think one of the things that we've done since opening our doors is really put together comprehensive policies to really dictate how adults interact with children, how coaches interact with athletes. Uh, and so, one, making sure that every one of these, or every one of the NGBs and every one of these events understands what those sports, what those policies look like, but also knowing that the Center for State Sport actively and annually audits against every one of those uh, those policies. Uh, and okay. So, All right. oh, sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, and did, did you want to finish? I'm sorry. I was just trying to. Oh no! To I, go just, I, I just I just have lots to say. <laughs> That's okay. Good. Well, I can also get more in writing. And I wanted to just ask Professor Kohler, since you 
know and work with my husband, um, what is a way we can ensure victims have the support they need? I know that your testimony highlighted that systemic change is needed even outside of um, beyond safe sport. Thank you for that question, Senator Klobuchar. Um, I defer to, of course, Ms. French to talk about specifically what survivors need and what would be best for them. But in terms of what our commission reported, um, we believe that a solution that ensures that athletes are not vulnerable, sort of in a holistic way, is really the answer. And so we have, um, in addition to the safe sport recommendations, decoupling the funding from the USOPC, we have made a proposal, a recommendation, that the Team USA athletes Athlete Commission uh, be established as an independent entity, an independent, a truly independent voice um, for athletes. If athletes feel that they have a voice in the movement, if they are not vulnerable, um, they will be much, much safer. In addition, uh, we have proposed that uh, Congress take away um, at the USOPC suggestion, which they've talked about for decades, um, their dual mandate um, to both coordinate and develop grassroots and youth sports and uh, sort of cultivate the high performance pipeline. So many children participate in youth sports, as Ms. Colon has said. They sit outside the jurisdiction of safe sport. These are, these are children who are not um, within the safety provisions that Congress has provided uh, through safe sport. And so we have proposed that when, for instance, uh, the federal government makes grants, which it often does, to youth sport programs, um, we believe those grants should be increased. Those grants should be run through a clearinghouse in the Office of the Department of Health and Human Services, which we proposed in the report. Um, and that is part of that. Um, youth sport providers, um, that grant money that supports youth sport be conditioned on signing on to safe sport jurisdiction and the protection that safe sport provides. So I recommend okay. our report to you. Um, I think we have lots right. of recommendations that would keep athletes safe beyond safe sport. Okay, very good. Thanks. Last um, uh, kind of uh, ending on an upbeat here, um, Mr. Kelleher. Um, I recently met with leaders from the recently formed Professional Women's Hockey League. We're very excited that of the six teams, one is from Minnesota. We actually had 13,000 fans uh, for the opening game against Montreal. Um, I'm going to an event tonight again with the Canadians to uh, celebrate this. And in 2017, I was a, one of the leaders in efforts to resolve wage disputes. Um, and I want to thank Senator Cantwell for her leadership on that. But could you talk about what USA Hockey is doing to foster a safe environment for women players? Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Yes, we look at all of our participants, male, female. Uh, we have six different disciplines of disabled sport under USA Hockey, and we have to provide a safe space safe environment for every every athlete from national team players from players uh, in the in the you know at the highest levels of our sport down to the grassroots community so we have uh, we we had our own safe sport program started in 2012 uh, we've been leaders within the space within the movement um, and also working with the u.s center for safe sport to protect every participant in the sport of ice hockey in the u.s that's related to usa hockey i think a point should be should be expanded upon is that the national governing bodies take that responsibility very seriously we recognize we we came here from a bad place several years ago and why we're here in a lot of cases but the national governing bodies do a lot of this work across the board for youth sports um, throughout our country and we believe that we follow the the strongest guidelines through the center for safe sport through background screens through everything we do to provide to be proactive um, provide education that we do through the center. USA Hockey alone does 140,000 adults through our safe sport training on an annual basis. We, we run 70,000 background checks on an annual basis. We're trying to set the environment to be as safe as possible and then recognizing that if something happens, we have to take action. And we do that at the grassroots level all the way to the national level. So we okay. recognize that safety is the number one priority across the board, Senator. Thank you. Thank all of you very much. And thank you to you, Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, thank all of you. Again, this is the last time I'll thank you because um, uh, we're at the end. And, you know, the, the revelations that came about of, with Larry Nasser's despicable actions, the world will never be the same after that. But you all are working diligently, I think, seeing great progress towards making sure we work our way back towards a sense of, of security and safety where our athletes can feel they can work with their coaches and their, their teammates. Uh, there are other athletes that they, that they train with 
uh, in an environment where they can grow and not feel the anxiety and fear that, that, that really the whole world felt uh, after the revelations about Larry Nasser. And he may be serving 100 years in jail, um, but his, his impact is still there, and you're doing, I think, great work to, to really push back against that. Um, this does conclude the hearing for today. Um, again, thank you each and all of you for your efforts, not just today, but leading up to today. Uh, I mean, it's a, this is one of the most important discussions we can have. And team sports and individual sports are something that have always brought this country together. And we have to make sure that we can get, continue to move back into that, in that direction. Uh, the hearing record will remain open for senators to submit additional questions. You'll be surprised. You'll get additional questions, I promise. Uh, questions for the record for two weeks until April 3rd, 2024. Um, any senator can submit uh, questions uh, for the record, and they may do so until then. Uh, we ask witnesses uh, to submit responses to those questions by April 17th. Uh, quick turnaround. Um, but again, we appreciate your, all your time in this. With that, the committee is now adjourned. And I have to apologize. I got to run off and vote. <laughs>